couple of years ago, Jordan Peterson tweeted, the Scottish education system has apparently become a social justice propaganda delivery mechanism. And that was based on things that it found on the General Teaching Council for Scotland, GTCS's website. Now, just last week, The Spectator magazine published this article, again, making the same point relating to GTCS and political bias. That's two things from outside Scotland. From within Scotland, I've never heard a word about this topic, apart from, from the Scottish Family Party. We seem to be the lone voice pointing out the obvious. It's not because we've got exceptional powers of analysis. This is in plain sight. It's just for reason or reasons unknown, Scotland seems to be the land of groupthink and conformity. Now, the Spectator article last week, that was based on the new draft professional standards. GTCS is producing a new set of ideals that teachers have to uh, adhere to, to uphold in order to be teachers. If you don't uphold them, obviously you get struck off. So I've written to GTCS to express uh, my opinion on those on behalf of the Scottish Family Party. Let's have a look what it's all about. Dear sir or madam, I write with regard to the draft professional standards. I offer a critique of some passages and concepts therein. What a polite chap I am. Citing social justice as a professional value is wrong. Social justice is a contested political ideology, so demanding allegiance to it amounts to a political bar on entering the teaching profession. Now that's a pretty serious accusation, isn't it? But what will their response be? Well, let's see. Right, the definition offered. Social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political and social rights and opportunities, reflects the view of social justice advocates and denies the view of critics of this political ideology. The usual understanding of social justice goes far beyond GTCS's definition. It might be claimed that this doesn't matter, as the term is clearly defined in this context. This is not a valid response as GTCS effectively commends the ideology usually associated with the term social justice. To illustrate my point, it's like declaring Marxism as a professional standard, then defining Marxism as the belief that everyone in their society should have what they need, or demanding that teachers accept conservatism, defined as preserving what is good in our society. I mean, the other classic example of this is when people say, oh, we're for feminism. Feminism just means treating men and women equally, giving them equal opportunities. Whereas modern feminism doesn't mean that at all. So their definition doesn't really capture what social justice means. Right, so I'll explain to them. Social justice is generally taken to embrace a number of left-wing progressive political causes, but primary among its tenets is the pursuit of equity rather than just equality. GTCS refers to both in the standards, thereby acknowledging the difference between them. Seeking equity entails the pursuit of equality of outcome between different groups in society. Critics of this project believe that it inevitably results in injustice to individuals. Generally, those on the left of politics approve of policies granting favour to particular groups in the name of equity, equality of outcome, while those on the right do not, preferring instead to seek equality of opportunity. GTCS demands that teachers adopt the left-leaning perspective. Now, I think that's pretty clear, isn't it? But I think this just seems like, it's like firing a bullet into a lake of jelly. There's nothing to hit, there's nothing to bounce off, there's no resistance, it just goes off and disappears into the blob. Anyway, carrying on. To quote a United Nations document, by the mid-20th century, the concept of social justice had become central to the ideologies and programmes of virtually all the leftist and centrist political parties around the world. So even the UN, which is hardly unbiased, concedes that social justice is a sort of left-wing or centrist at best uh, doctrine. The right-wing parties don't really adopt it. So from a right-leaning thinker, we have this. Frederick Hayek of the Austrian School of Economics rejected the very idea of social justice as meaningless, self-contradictory and ideological, believing that to realise any degree of social justice is unfeasible 
and that the attempt to do so must destroy all liberty. There can be no test by which we can discover what is socially unjust because there is no subject by which such an injustice can be committed. Social justice does not belong to the category of error, but to that of nonsense, like the term a moral stone. According to Hayek, the function of social justice is to blame someone else, often attributed to the system, or those who are supposed mythically to control it. Thus it is based on the appealing idea of you suffer, your suffering is caused by powerful others, these oppressors must be destroyed. These quotations are just from the Wikipedia page on social justice. I can expand, expand on my case if requested. The reason I went to Wikipedia is I'm just trying to show GTCS that I didn't go digging around on the internet to find the things that agreed with me. This is just the, the sort of obvious content that you would look at in these areas. Anyway, continuing. Much under the heading of social justice in the draft professional standards is nothing more than common goodwill promoting health and well-being of self, colleagues and children and young people in my care, and building and fostering positive relationships in the learning community. Proponents of a political ideology will always seek to present it as the encapsulation of all that is good and true. But GTCS should not be complicit in such an endeavour. Demonstrating a commitment to engaging learners in real-world issues to encourage learning our way to a better future. This also raises concerns about political partiality. Seeking a, seeking a better future with regard to real world issues is the business of politics. It seems like GTCS believes that particular solutions to these problems can be taught to children. It's hard to see how this can avoid teaching politically contested ideas as though they were universally accepted and or beneficial. Now, another aspect of this I didn't mention in the letter, even by laying out what the main problems are that need solving in the world also has a political skew because people from different political uh, persuasions will have different ideas of what the priorities are. But GTCS, they think they can teach kids uh, the facts about this. Right, I continue. The children's rights emphasis again betrays an ideological skew. Generally speaking, those on the progressive left of politics are rights enthusiasts. Those of the conservative right are more sceptical. GTCS chooses to place rights at the core of its moral vision. For all of the celebration and publication of children's rights material in school, it's hard to see what difference it's made. Almost all of the UN CRC articles have no relevance for Scottish school children, and where relevance is claimed, for example about listening to children, the interpretation is creative beyond any original intention of the Convention. Again, the trend towards regarding rights as a foundation stone of morality is unjustified and betrays a commitment to a contested philosophical outlook. Now, when GTCS read this, what they will hear is that I'm saying that it should be okay to torture children. I genuinely don't think they'll be able to see beyond that sort of interpretation. Anyway, one can but try. Right, here's another standard. Committing to social justice through fair, transparent, inclusive and sustainable policies and practices in relation to protected characteristics, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion, belief, sex, sexual orientation and intersectionality. This sounds admirable, but in the light of the political and philosophical bias already evident, there's reason to expect that this standard will not be interpreted and applied in a fair and inclusive manner. Can GTCS offer an assurance that teachers who hold religious and other beliefs that might be unfashionable and at odds with the left liberal progressive philosophy that drives the GTCS will be treated fairly and that their rights to freedom of expression and association and political engagement will be respected? Well, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, really. I already know the answer is no from my own experience. I won't talk about that again. Uh, but anyway, we can see what they'd like to say about that. The term intersectionality is a relatively recent addition to the lexicon of the identity politics that usually goes under the banner of social justice. Again, GTCS may claim that it uses the term independently of its usual meaning within the identity politics movement. But the fact that the word has appeared in the standards at this point in time obviously shows that it is intended to reference this ideology. 
GTCS should understand that many object to the interpretation of various personal characteristics as indications of oppression, victimhood or disadvantage. Critics see this way of thinking as divisive, leading to a society of competing special interest groups. Those embracing Marxist ideas, on the other hand, are always keen to emphasise group identity and purported oppressed group status. In fact, a section of the Wikipedia page about intersectionality is classified as part of a series about Marxism. Now, I think that's pretty hard hitting. It's quite logically incisive, but I think it's just another bullet into the jelly lake. It's impossible to imagine a conversation at GTCS where you know two or three people get around the table looking at my letter and say, you know, I think he's got a point there. I'm not quite sure what he says. Maybe we should ask him to clarify this. This sounds quite important. It is impossible to even imagine that conversation taking place because the person who made the initial noise that maybe he's got a point that would be so damaging to their career within the organisation that they would just think, I'm not going to be the one to say that. Right, continuing. Another quotation from the standards. Valuing as well as respecting social, cultural, religious and racial diversity. This goes too far. Treating people respectfully is a valid demand from GTCS. Showing a degree of respect towards people's religious and cultural beliefs is also a reasonable standard for teachers, so long as it does not preclude disagreeing with other people's opinions, especially outside of the school context. However, valuing goes much further. To value religious diversity, one must be a religious pluralist, someone who believes that all religious belief systems are embodiments of a single divine truth, that religions are superficially different, but fundamentally the same. To value something is to see it in a positive light, as desirable. Mainstream, mainstream adherents of the world's religions generally do not view religious diversity as desirable. Instead, they wish that all would embrace what they see as the true religion. Many atheists take a similar position, wishing that all would reject religious beliefs. Diverse religious beliefs are competing and contradictory truth claims. Respecting people regardless of their beliefs and treating their beliefs with a degree of respect, or at least not disrespect, is a reasonable though highly subjective demand. Expecting teachers to value the presence of mutually contradictory religious beliefs is not. Now, again, what do GTCS hear when they read that? What they hear is, or what they imagine, is that you know I'd be a teacher and a boy would come in and he'd say, I'm a Muslim. And I'd say, oh dear, never mind. Even though there's no reason at all to imagine that, I've expressed myself, I think, perfectly clearly. I genuinely don't think they're able to understand it because they live in, in a parallel universe that precludes even understanding of other perspectives. Right, to continue. Valuing racial diversity must logically entail regarding racial homogeneity as somehow less desirable. This view elevates racial diversity as a virtue, leading to an unnecessary and divisive emphasis on race. What might be intended to convey a message of welcome and appreciation to minority race pupils ends up being a source of resentment and division. Now you've got to imagine the person at GTCS reading this, how deep will their analysis and understanding of my comment be? I think it will go about as far as thinking, he's a racist. Right, carrying on to another standard. Trust is a belief. Respect is that trust in action. To which I respond, I find this perplexing, as it seems quite divorced from the usual meaning of respect. I'm being polite there. What I really mean is, hey, I mean, what are you talking about? Respect is an instantiation of trust. So if you don't trust someone, that means that you disrespect them. Is it okay to disrespect people you don't trust? Do you have to trust people? Even people who've got every reason not to? I mean, this just doesn't make sense. I mean, it sounds like it's been written by, you know, table number two at the seminar, uh, having stuck their post-it notes to the giant picture of a teacher uh, on the whiteboard. And then the facilitator, no, sorry, then the facilitator says, thanks, that's brilliant. But has anyone really thought that through? I'm not sure they have. Respecting individual difference and supporting learners' understanding of themselves, others and their contribution to the development and sustainability of a device and inclusive society. Again, a little clumsy, you might think. As with many sentences, this one is convoluted and unclear. 
The meaning intended seems to cover affirming pupils in alternative gender identities. Many teachers will not feel that this is in the best interests of pupils. Again, what does the person at GTCS um, think when they read that? They just think transphobic, ignore. Well, next bit. Critically examining professional beliefs, values and attitudes of self and others in the context of collegiate working. Challenging assumptions, biases and professional practice where appropriate. I respond, an excellent inclusion in the standards as there is scant evidence of such critical reflection currently. Now, that's what I'm doing in this letter. I am reflecting on biases in professional practice. I'm challenging assumptions. But what will happen? It will be ignored. What do they, they mean by challenging assumptions and biases? What they mean is basically seeing the light and moving over to their perspective. Right, my final paragraph. I hope that you can seriously consider my points. GTCS has been criticised for political bias in the past, most recently in The Spectator magazine, and I hope that my comments can help GTCS to better understand why this conclusion is reached. I would be happy to discuss or debate these issues in any context. Now, sadly, I feel that writing this letter was useful because I can present in the video. Sending it to GTCS is most probably a complete waste of time. I spent over 20 years involved in Scottish education and I learned that offering an intelligent critique of government policy or the prevailing philosophy of education, uh, which is the same thing, has zero impact. If you do it within a school, well, the school has to obey. If you don't toe the line, you'll get slated in an inspection. So if you're someone in the school saying, you know, I don't actually see it this way. I think the direction of travel here actually isn't right. The school doesn't think, oh, well, even if the school leaders completely agree with you, you're a dangerous character in the school. Because if you persuade other people to share your view, you know, the inspectors come in and they find people don't quite agree with the, uh, you know, SMP philosophy, then the school's in trouble. So you're not a useful perspective. You're a danger to uh, the school because you might provoke a bad inspection report. If you go above the school level, you just get to the blob. I mean, another way of looking at it is like jumping into a sea of jelly and try to wrestle with it. You either drown and become part of it or you have to get out of it. Um, Scottish Parliament, discussion of education, it's just part of the blob. They're just completely blind to all these issues. So the Scottish Family Party, we want to get in there and inject some genuine critique into educational debate. Put the government on the spot, make them answer questions on these issues. Now, how will GTCS defend themselves against this? Well, probably they won't even reply, but if they do, they'll say that, oh, no, no, that's not what we meant by social justice. Well, let's try and dig a bit deeper. Now, R Rowena Arshad is someone who uh, writes for GTCS sometimes, quite closely associated with them. And she's the head of teacher training at Morrie House at Edinburgh University. And she edited a book called Social Justice Reexamined. And this is a book for teachers and trainee teachers explaining about social justice in education. So let's see how social justice is interpreted at the heart of the educational establishment. Just like to say at this point, I hope you appreciate the things I do for you. I've ploughed through this whole book. Okay, it was not the most stimulating experience. So the very least you could do in appreciation is subscribe to this channel uh, right now. So let's have a look through this book and see what the various contributors have got to say. So here we go. There's some absolute crackers in this. But let's start in the uh, little recommendations page uh, at the front. So we've got a recommendation from Claire Chalmers, a young teacher in the city of Edinburgh. The time is ripe for thinking about teaching as an activist profession. We can reshape the lives of our students by giving them the tools to challenge and change their world. Activist profession. What's an activist? There's political activists. There's activists in other causes. So quite open acknowledgement that teaching is all about promoting a particular cause to pupils. Uh, now, Claire Chalmers, uh, this book's, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, year, 10 years old or whatever. Um, Claire Chalmers, young teacher in the city of Edinburgh. I thought probably her career has probably taken off if she's on this line. I thought I'll just do a quick Google search. Claire uh, Chalmers, Edinburgh School. Uh, she, it, it seems like She's now working for the University of Edinburgh in the teacher training department. Right, in the forward. 
The quest for fairness and equality is not a straightforward one, either in society at large or within education. Indeed, since one of the purposes of a state education system is, prepare young, is to prepare young people to take up particular roles in society, both in their homes and in their workplaces, in other words, to prepare young people for different life experiences with different rewards and different levels of satisfaction, it could be argued that the education system itself is there to legitimate inequality in society. I mean, that sounds like a Marxist writing, doesn't it? So this inequality in society is such a bad thing. And some people even think school is to prepare people for this. Anyway, uh, we should not forget that some children's families actually have sufficient wealth to buy a supposedly superior education for their children through a private school system that runs in parallel. Can that be socially just, we may ask? Again, so hard left ideology coming through pretty strongly there. Um, I don't quite see what the injustice is there, though. If you think independent schools aren't any better, why is there any sort of inequality that these parents are wasting their money to send their kids to them? I'm not sure you've thought that one through. Right, next bit. Uh, right, the second difficulty which emerged in the 1970s and 80s came from politicians with the rise to dominance of the new right in politics, largely associated in the UK with Margaret Thatcher's government of the 1980s. There was a strong call for education to return to basics. Terrible. The creation of a, a largely traditionalist national and some would say nationalistic curriculum in England in 1988 was just one element in a widespread attack on education as a means of social transformation. Sounds good to me. Uh, in one infamous speech, Thatcher denounced what such approaches, sorry, Thatcher denounced such approaches, making fun of anti-racist mathematics, whatever that may be, she said. Well, well done, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, shame there's not people in the Scottish Conservative Party making similar points today. Right, so what do I have here? Teaching can and should be an activist profession. So that young teacher had picked up the message pretty clearly. Teachers who engage with social justice issues are better able to offer pupils an academically rigorous education. Right, that is rubbish. What they're trying to do there is just cover, cover their backs. Because the argument would be, if you spend all your time on this politically correct nonsense, you're not going to be teaching maths and English very well and standards are going to go down, which is obviously a, a pretty sound argument. But she's saying here, no, you get the best of both worlds. The more you focus on this other politically motivated nonsense, the more academically rigorous your education becomes. Does anyone really believe that? But anyway, she's got that in the textbook here. Uh, that, that's from the, the woman in charge at Murray House. Right, the first is that teachers for social justice need to explicitly acknowledge that justice exists in society and that for various reasons, some people are more privileged than others. So this would be this sort of white privilege sort of idea. The first teachers, the first is that teachers for social justice need to explicitly acknowledge. So that sounds like to be a teacher, you have to acknowledge that whole system of thought. Teachers can be agents of change or they can be guardians of the status quo. Guardians of the status quo, that obviously is an evil thing. Agents of change, the sort of change that they want, is obviously a great virtue. For example, by a subtle change of wording, a teacher can change the tone of a sentence or situation. The congested streets of Mumbai, or they could say, the bustling streets of Mumbai. The term congested gives the image of excessive crowding and a somewhat chaotic situation. However, bustling creates a picture of noisy but acceptably exciting and busy situation. Values can be imparted unconsciously through the choice of word or content of what we teach. In other words, talking about the congested streets of Mumbai, that's a bit racist. And if you're a better teacher, you'd say the bustling streets of Mumbai. I assume the streets of Glasgow can be congested. Obviously, that would be fine, but not Mumbai. Even if they're like gridlocked with traffic and you can't budge, they're not congested. They have to be bustling. I mean, this is what teachers have been trained with in Scotland. Gina's belief that treating all her pupils in the same way meant she was being equal and fair is at best naive and at worst potentially damaging and discriminatory. Yeah, treating everyone the same and in an equal way and fairly is discriminatory. 
I don't need to comment on that. Let's just move on. The influence of the church or religion was not always positive, however. Two teachers in particular questioned whether the church, as an establishment, or religions in general, sat comfortably with the principles of equality and human rights. Well, at least they're open about it. Um, when I decide that, this is a quotation from a teacher, when I decided to marry my boy boyfriend, I went to my minister, who'd been my minister when I was growing up. He knew I wanted to be a missionary, and I had just finished my teacher training. So when I went to talk to the minister about getting married, he realised I was living with my boyfriend and said he wouldn't marry me. This was about 60 years ago, and I was still attending church and ran youth groups. If this was such a condemnable sin, living with someone who really loves me and who I really love, I think Jesus would forgive this. I mean, what does this do in, in a book for training teachers? I mean, that, that's just an attack on the traditional Christian belief. But another teacher who is a lesbian felt that while lesbian and gay people could actively challenge issues like Islamophobia or sectarianism, people of faith did not always support her right to be a lesbian or the right to have same-sex marriage. This made it difficult for her at times to empathise with people of faith. Right, how unreasonable of these people of faith for sticking to the beliefs of their religions. In one school I visited, in the overwhelmingly white Scottish Highlands, a teacher was trying to use aspects of critical pedagogy to explore issues of racism with her lower secondary English class. She had read an essay uh, which described how the author identified some of the daily effects of white privilege in my life by drawing up a list of 50 unsought advantages relating to whiteness. The teacher did a similar exercise with her all-white class, followed by a discussion about the experiences of racism they had found in a book they'd been reading. So that's an example of good practice. Right, here's a, a quotation from a teacher. This is an example of good practice. Take my class of fairly hard football-loving primary sevens who are doing finger knitting right now and are going to sell their wares as part of an enterprise project. That is about challenging kids to be creative and being allowed to like pink and fluffy and encouraging them to express themselves and to be cool doing something a little bit different. So getting boys to do something that they probably, most of them didn't really want particularly to do and would be more associated with girls, that's a huge victory. You know, the teachers made a breakthrough there. Uh, carrying on, the teachers making a conscious effort to challenge the hegemonic masculinity of some boys and does so by appealing to their sense of power within the class. So using their sense of themselves to subvert the very thing that gives them that sense of dominance. In other words, these evil, stupid boys, we can exploit their stupidity and evil and subvert it in order to make them want to do girly things. The way I do it is quite sly, says the teacher, in that I take aside the really cool kids in the class who are the beautiful footballers, very keen and very good, and say, guys, what do you think about this as a money-making idea? You know these phrases they have, the bands they wear around their wrists. I say, how about we make our own and start our own phrase? And if you get them on board, then it becomes cool. They get into it and start weaving, and they go, look at this. Wow, let's hoodwink those stupid evil boys again and got them doing what the teacher wants. Okay, on to a new chapter. Education is a key site for struggles over equality and justice. From the ways in which educators and policymakers define education, decide who are the successful learners, determining the content of curricula, and configure relationships in classrooms, education is deeply, deeply political. Now, let's just look at that again. The ways in which educators and policymakers define and decide who are successful learners. So they decide. It's not that the pupils are examined and you see who comes out best. The policymakers and educators decide who the successful learners are. So if you get an A, it's not because you're good, it's just because they decided you're the sort of person who's going to get an A. If you got an E, not that you're not really good at it, it's just that they happen to decide you're the sort of person who gets an E. How unfair! I mean, do we not need some sort of revolution against this injustice? It sounds like it. It can generate views, perspectives and expectations the foster critique and problematizations of the ways in which we organize our social life. When we say that education is political, we mean much more than which political party you vote for, or even which party's education policies you support. We mean that education at all levels is shaped by relations of power. 
relations of powers. In other words, a Marxist perspective is being promoted. For instance, between policymakers and practitioners, between teachers and pupils, between head teachers and more junior staff, within each of these relations of, of power exists between different social groups, such as women and men, members of different social classes or different ethnic and racial groups, for educational practices to help and support learning for democracy, equality and progressive social change. So quite blatantly obvious, not conservative, progressive social change. We need to have a firm grasp of differing conceptions of social justice and their implications for teaching, curricula and social relations at school. Obviously, the people writing this don't even feel the slightest need to try and be subtle or to cover up their political bias. It can just be on full show because they know just no one will say anything. Everyone just agrees in any case. Social justice is typically conceptualized as redistribution in terms of the fair allocation of income, wealth and resources in a given society. Redistributing wealth, which side of the political spectrum uh, is most keen on that? Liberty. Compared to their white counterparts, young Afro-Caribbean and Asian men are far more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, says the Guardian. Regardless of their class backgrounds or criminal histories, these men are usually prime targets for being stopped, questioned and or detained. Stop and search can be seen as, self, as a self-fulfilling prophecy because a larger proportion of black and Asian men are stopped and searched. It's assumed that it's mostly black and Asian men who commit the majority of crimes. That makes no sense at all, but you can see there's a mindset that's been promoted here. Equality. Young women typically outperform their male counterparts in education. They leave school with more qualifications and are more likely to go to university and do better than their male peers in higher education. Right, is that an equality problem? Is that something they're going to highlight or something they need to deal with? Of course not. That's not a problem at all. However, women still experience significant labour market discrimination. Although they're better qualified, they are less likely to earn the same amount as men or be promoted into management and leadership positions. Gender, therefore, has an important influence on women's equality in the workforce. Right, I won't explain that issue again, but you can see obviously it's promoting a particular feminist ideology with which I disagree. Right, moving on. Uh, understanding the redistribution and recognition paradigm. Whatever that means. What explains the unequal economic outcomes of these diverse groups? Well, let's see what the explanations are. People making different decisions, maybe? No. Exploitation, marginalisation, deprivation. Oh, there's a section here. We need more men in teaching, don't we? Now, these would be the people who argue that you need uh, equal numbers of men and women in Parliament and, and uh, in the boardroom, everywhere else. But do we need more men in teaching? And the answer is no, uh, because basically there's no such thing as men and women. Gender is just a social construct, so it actually makes no difference. Does everywhere else, but not in teaching. The fact that teaching is vast majority women isn't a problem for them at all. Right, another, another report of the sort of key education that's going on in Scottish schools. I don't want pink paper. I was doing an RE lesson with a primary two class and one of the activities required a blank piece of paper. As the office had over-ordered certain colours of photocopy of paper, teachers had to use pink paper instead of white until it ran out. I'd nearly finished handing out each sheet when Terry looked at it with disgust and said, I don't want pink paper. The conversation went something like this. Terry, I don't want pink paper. Me, oh, why not? Terry, because pink paper is for girls. Me, uh, I see. What makes you think that? Terry, because all pink stuff is for girls. Me, what kinds of things do you mean? Terry, like tents and bikes and gl with glitter on them. Me, what colour of paper would you like? Terry, blue. Then Terry looks to Jason. At this point, some of Terry's friends and a few boys from a different group started to complain about the colour of the paper. Terry looked smug and sat back, allowing the others to carry on the argument for him. Nasty piece of work, Terry. I mean, this is just typical of boys, isn't it? We really need to re-educate boys. Let's look more closely at what Terry is doing here. He refuses to take a piece of pink piece of paper because he's a boy and believes pink is not for boys. He gives the reason that pink is for girls, so places himself as opposite to girls. 
as I mentioned before. The behaviour expected of a good boy is different from that of a good girl. Furthermore, the idea of a good girl and a good boy are set up as opposing ideas, as a binary. That's just rubbish. Uh, the binary is the foundation for the social construction of masculinity and femininity, and why the Yorkie advert is worded in such a way, as it's assumed that being biologically male or female dictates the characteristics of male or female. What? It's believed that the sex of a person dictates their personality. This is why a person's biological sex is often expressed as the natural way for them to be. I'm not even going to begin to try and make sense of that. I'm just showing you what's in the book. Okay, as if pink paper wasn't a serious enough issue, we're really getting into the heavy stuff now. Never mind the maths and the English and, and learning to be polite and behave yourself. We need to deal with this. The advert where Nanor's knit shreddies came up, which prompted a lot of discussion about other granny characters on television. The children also spoke about stories they'd read uh, when we talked about character traits and the idea of granny. They said she is kind, old, bent over, wears skirts and tights and cardigans, likes baking, has false teeth, looks after everyone and is vulnerable and ill. I then got the children to think about the older people they knew and asked them if they fitted this mould. Some of them did, but most of them didn't, and they soon picked out lots of other attributes that a granny could have. Wow. What a triumph in the lesson there. Whilst focusing on granny was related to gender and age, these sessions were more concerned with challenging the fairy tale genre generally and opening children's minds to the possibility of seeing the world in different ways. Okay, your taxes go to pay people to teach this junk to people preparing to be teachers in order that they can teach this junk to your children in school. Right, I've got another horror story here. Uh, this, uh, just listen to this. Two strong boys. When the janitor came into my P3 class, seven-year-olds, and asked for two strong boys to help him to move some tables, I saw an opportunity to open up a discussion about the discourse of the strong male and weak female. I asked all the children who would like to help and sent two who put up their hands. They happened to be a boy and a girl. You liar. You deliberately chose a boy and a girl. Um, I then opened up a class discussion, firstly about physical strength and then about other kinds of strength like confidence. We concluded that not all boys were strong and not all girls were weak, which proved to be another small step in opening up what Benjamin calls counter-discursive positionings. Now, personally, I think if the janitor says, would a couple of boys like to come and help, or strong boys or whatever, then that's perfectly fine. If the boys think, yeah, I'll be a gentleman, I'll, I'll do this, you know, this bit of you know, heavy labour, rather than the girls having to do it, I'll do that. And that's quite gentlemanly and noble. But no. In recent years, a difference-blind approach has become commonplace, whether it's related to race, class or gender. This is neither helpful nor respectful approach to take. Accepting difference allows discursive space to open up. I don't want all children to be the same. I want them to accept each other for who they are. Again, just attacking this idea that if you just treat everyone the same and you're not really interested in these distinctions, then that's really bad. You've got to enable them to accept each other for who they are. As if that's the alternative, as if these are different things. Chapter 5. Using critical literacy to do gender. Right, a little quote at the beginning. Teacher, so do you think Lady Macbeth has no voice? Is silence then? Pupil, no, but she's like my mum. She's only got a voice inside the castle. It's Macbeth who really gets to do what he wants. In the end, he's the one with the power. He tells her to shut up and go away, and she does. She kills herself. So this is showing how to use literature for feminist indoctrination. Power. Critical literacy recognizes that texts are always about power. Texts are always about power. So whatever book you're reading, whatever poem, whatever film, text includes films in their definition, it's about power. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about love. It's not about anything else. Everything is about power. Uh, which is like the Marxists say, actually. That's a remarkable coincidence, isn't it? Taking action. Again, this is about teaching English literature. The reader may choose to take action in response to a text. 
One example of this amongst young people in the UK has been the school strike action taken by pupils in response to the Blair proposal for war in Iraq. This is the precursor to the climate strike. So they've got the idea that you teach the pupils what political views they should hold, and then you encourage them to engage in political activism. And when they do, you chalk that up as a success for your teaching, uh, like they've done here. So other questions you can ask in, uh, in literature when you're studying a novel or a poem or whatever, how is gender constructed in the text? How is race constructed in the text? How is class constructed in the text? Who or what has power in the text? Whose voices are not heard in this text? Are there gaps in this text? Are there silences in this text? It's, again, using literature for political indoctrination. And there's another example of using a book with like a Little Red Riding Hood substitute book where Little Red Riding Hood is actually male. And then they discuss that. There's a little bit of a quote from the chapter about homophobia. This patriarchal dividend is not equally available to all men. In other words, that male privilege is not available to all men. So in that case, is it really male privilege? So is male privilege available to some females, since some females might have characteristics similar to males? I mean, does the whole idea of this patriarchal dividend just fall to bits? Seems like it does, but that's mere logic. We've got a great one here. Challenging Islamophobia, a whole school approach, set in the context. Islamophobia is not a new phenomenon. Anti-Muslim sentiment can be traced back as far as the Middle Ages. Okay. The first crusade to recapture the Holy Land began in November 1095. The Reconquista of Spain in 1492 ended the ascendancy of the Islamic world. I mean, this is just totally nuts. So we're saying these are examples of the start of anti-Muslim sentiment. In other words, the start of Islamophobia. Whereas these were battles where basically Muslims had taken over territory and then Christians or non-Muslims at least fought against them to push out of the, push them out of the territory they'd taken over. But as far as this book's concerned, that's the roots of Islamophobia. Right, this is talking about the publication of Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses a decade later. In 1989, is another key moment in the proliferation of anti-Muslim rhetorical strategies in Britain. Remember, Salman Rushdie's Satanic version, uh, Verses was published. Uh, lots of Muslims around the world called for Salman Rushdie to be beheaded or whatever. It said, public protests against the novel allowed the media to circulate a new image of intolerant Muslims. So in other words, the media somehow deviously presented this image of intolerant Muslims by reporting on intolerant Muslims. I, I mean, it's difficult to know where to start here. Obviously, I, I'm, not all Muslims would have been protesting like that, but around the world, there were a lot that were, and the media reported it. Simple as that. It recommends an exercise where pupils take news reports that include references to Muslims and then rewrite them to make them uh, more positive towards Islam and Muslims. Would they ever do that about Christians? Maybe? Uh, no. Okay, we're into the chapter about religion now. The concept of organized religion may raise many issues of interest for social justice, not least in the areas of wealth and power. It may seem problematic that Christianity, emblematic as it is of the colonial endeavor should produce subjects which now merit uh, protection from the potential effects of social exclusion. Right, I don't quite understand the last bit, it doesn't seem to make sense, but uh, Christianity emblematic as it is of the colonial endeavor. Right, I could take some time to explain why that's uh, an unjustified statement, but you can see the sort of thinking that's going through. I say, stuff the teacher's heads full of this nonsense, and then they'll in turn pass it on to pupils. Right, social class. I wonder who we're, going to, who we're going to hear from here. A good starting point for breaking down this association is Marx's argument that society was dividing more and more into two major classes. Those who own the means of production, i.e. the wealthy who own land, mines and factories, workers for wages who have only their labour power to sell and need to work for the first group or else starve. And so he goes on to expound uh, Marxist ideology. 
We're now on to the chapter about race. The second way the phrase is used is where race equality is viewed as a measurable outcome. Achieving race equality would mean reducing any gaps between people of different racial groups in employment, educational achievement, and so on. It could be argued that both uses of the phrase are necessary if we are to be effective. So absolute explicit endorsement of what I was saying about the equity mindset, seeking equality of outcome. Very controversial view. It might be useful here to pause and consider the term race. This is a term which comes from, hist from historical attempts to categorize people according to their skin color and physical characteristics. It is therefore a socially constructed term without scientific basis and in itself somewhat meaningless. <coughs> and in itself somewhat meaningless. Individuals, not races, are the main source of human variation. So the term race is somewhat meaningless, but it has a whole chapter about it, about how we deal with it. Um, the idea that race has no scientific basis, um, it's just a pitiful standard of argument, but it just goes unchallenged. Though. In literature or music, the classics are largely portrayed as coming from Europe, did other big civilizations of Asia, the Middle East, and Africa not produce great literature and music too? Uh, I don't know, really. I can't say I've read many Chinese novels. Um, are you suggesting we teach Chinese literature to school children? Um, well, obviously, they're not going to understand it. But the other point is as well, you introduce people to the riches of their own culture. And we live in Western culture. Okay, There's other people who have come into that. They've chosen to enter into that. But we live in Western culture. And so that is what we should be preserving, presenting and celebrating primarily in schools. And in terms of music, I would say, for example, my personal opinion is that the music of uh, Europe over the last few hundred years is, is the best. That's my view. I, I think it's, it's superior to music from other parts of the world. Uh, people might disagree with that. But that happens to be my view. Are you allowed to think that? Seems like you're not. The dominant approach from the 50s to the late 70s was an assimilationist model. According to this philosophy, ethnic minorities were expected to leave behind their distinctive identity in order to fit in with the values, attitudes and behaviours of the dominant group or culture. The term was often used to describe the process of immigrants fitting into their new country by adopting its customs and habits. When in Rome, do as the Romans. In schools, this involved discouraging pupils from speaking any language other than English, and pupils were even advised to discourage, sorry, parents were even advised to discourage their children from speaking other languages than English at home. Where they're saying that's a bad thing. So pupils should be able to speak any language they like, even though that's going to be a major impediment to their career, their integration into virtually anything they want to be involved in, in this country, apart from within a very narrow section of society. But they're saying that's not an issue. We want to encourage people down that this sort of isolationist road. The rationale behind this was that these pupils would learn English faster and assimilate into their new culture, but this proved not to be the case. So learning English, improve your English, did, didn't help integration or assimilation. I mean, it was eventually recognised that the assimilationist approach tended to imply a negative attitude to the minority, a deficit perspective, and policymakers and teachers began to adopt the multicultural model instead. Right, again, I don't need to comment on that. I'm just showing you what's been promoted to teachers in Scotland. Right, next sort of section about incorrect assumptions. Incorrect. Some teachers adopt a colorblind approach where they pretend not to notice or care about issues of race or ethnicity. Uh, this assumption here is that we can treat everyone the same. Again, that's an incorrect assumption. If you say, I'm just not interested, I don't notice race, you treat everyone the same, then you're part of the problem. Teachers do need to develop an analytic understanding of the impact of difference and how difference is perceived, especially when some sections of the population have more power and influence or higher status than others. How else might the needs of every child be met in a practical way? So the implication there, when you're faced with an individual child, if that child, for example, has to be black, you must assume that they've got all these sort of disadvantages and whatever that you have to include that in the way that you deal with that child even though they might be the the child of the millionaire down the road or whatever you've got to take that into account otherwise you can't deal with them properly 
as an individual. Right, some tips about how to include race in different lessons. In physical education, you can provide opportunities to discuss how issues of racism prevent participation and fairness. Yeah, I see what they mean. I mean, if you look at sport, if you look at football teams, I mean, there's hardly any like black and minority ethnic people, is there? I mean, they're just completely white. I mean, there must be really terrible racism that's keeping, keeping these people out of sport. We, we should teach about that at school. In maths lessons, statistics can be used to alert pupils to race-related issues. Examples could be racial harassment statistics. So there you have it, the indoctrination manual uh, edited by Rowena Arshad in charge of uh, teacher education at Edinburgh University. I mean, it, it couldn't be clearer. They've got no effort to hide it at all. Blatant political indoctrination and it just goes unchallenged in Scotland. So I hope you find that a bit of an eye opener. And let's see how GTCS reply to my letter. My best guess is no reply. Anyway, I'm going to put a link to some other videos about GTCS and Education Scotland in the end screen here. Uh, but do remember our conference uh, coming up on 14th of November 2020, online conference on that Saturday. There'll be a link below. I would hope to see you on screen there. All right, thanks for watching.